Our New Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Philemon. We'll be reading Philemon in its entirety. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayer, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deeds might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps for this reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him, as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confidence of your obedience. I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. One more thing, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaparus, my fellow prisoner, and Christ Jesus sends greetings to you, and so does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Help is a novel that was published a few years ago and also made into a movie. And in the storyline, Eugenia, or Skeeter as she is more commonly called, has just returned home from graduating from the University of Mississippi. And she wants to become a professional writer. And for her first professional uh, book, she decides to interview some of the ladies in the community where she has grown up. Uh, specifically, she wants to interview the African-American women who work in the various white households of Jackson, Mississippi during the 1960s. Skeeter slowly builds up trust among these African-American women and begins to listen to their stories. Their stories are not quite what she expected as a white woman looking at these maids thinking they were all happy and content and living great lives. It is clear that the maids are not really regarded as complete human beings by the white employers. One of the stories that she hears is told to her by Abilene. Abilene tells about serving a luncheon at her employer's card club. 
While Abilene serves the food and fills up the drink glasses, the conversations among the white families turns to a local initiative in the community that is going to require all of the white homeowners to add another bathroom to the house, even if it has to be constructed outside of the home, because there has been a concern about the cleanliness and the hygiene and the sanitation of having those people use the family bathrooms. Remember, this was the 1960s when in public places there were separate restroom facilities and drink fountains for blacks and whites. And as Abilene is serving women their lunch and their iced tea, she hears all of this conversation going on as if she's not really there. Which, in a sense, from the white employer's point of view, she's not. She doesn't count. It's easy to look at people and not see them as people. They're not people. They're of the other race. That that man's not a person. He's homeless. He's a bomb. Uh, They're not people. They're people of the other political party. The rich look at the poor, they're not people, they're just poor trash. The common person looks at the wealthy and the powerful, they're not people. They don't know how real people have to live. One of the many things of the recent Me Too movement is that it can teach us that so many men look at women as objects. They're not real people. You can do anything you want to, and you can get away with it. In Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn... Young Huck has run away from home to escape an abusive father. And everyone thinks that poor Huck is dead. He's been murdered. But no, he's alive and well and, and drifting down the Mississippi in a canoe. And he takes refuge one night on Jackson's Island. And soon darkness falls over the island and, and he becomes afraid. He's exhausted. He's hungry. He's all alone. And well past midnight, he's walking around. He comes across a, uh, the, the remains of a campfire with some of the embers still burning. And in the light of the embers that are dying down, he sees this man laying on the ground. And then the man gets up and he stretches and he yawns and he's terrified until he realizes who this man is. It's Jim, Miss Watson's slave from back home. Jim, an escaped slave. And at this point, Huck Finn reflects, I was ever so glad to see Jim. I weren't so lonesome no more. This unlikely pair begins their journey down the Mississippi River. Two very different people, both in the same boat. Huck is, at the beginning of this journey, conflicted about his travel partner, uh, particularly conflicted about the sin and the crime of assisting an escaped runaway slave. He at one point even wonders if Jim has a soul. But being in the same boat, the two begin to talk and converse with each other, and they begin to bond with each other. And pretty soon, Huck looks at Jim as a close friend, a guardian, a mentor. And being in the same boat, they look at each other differently. They begin to see each other as... People, who would have thought? Which brings us to Philemon. Philemon, not quite the shortest book in the Bible, but pretty close to it. Close enough that you can read the whole book in two minutes and 38 seconds. I timed you. (laughs) Philemon, I don't remember anyone ever saying to those of us on a church staff, What the church needs is a 10-week study of the book of Philemon. I don't think anyone's ever picked as their favorite verse of the Bible, one of the 25 verses from Philemon. In fact, I've got to tell you, I've been preaching for 41 years, and I've kept track. I've got an Excel spreadsheet with every sermon I've preached, and this sermon you're hearing is my 2,750th sermon. You would have thought I would have gotten better at it by now. 
Never preached a single one on this book, which I guess is why I kind of picked it out today. It's not in the lectionary, the assigned reading that we often use. After all, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correction, training in righteousness. Which means that even Philemon, as short as it is, has something to say. And what this book teaches is that we are all in the same boat, just like Skeeter and Abilene in the book or the movie The Help, or Huck Finn and Jim in Mark Twain's novel. We're all in the same boat. Let me give you a little background. Paul is writing to a man named Philemon, which is where the book gets its title. He writes about Onesimus, a a slave who, like Huck Finn's Jim, ran away from the owner. And there's even an implication in the book that Onesimus may have stolen some money from his owner. And Paul promises to make uh, reparations for that. And sometime after running away from Philemon, Onesimus encounters Paul. Now, we don't know how that happens. It may have been that they knew each other uh, before Onesimus ran away. It may have been that uh, Onesimus heard Paul preach or heard about Paul, may even have been that they were cellmates for a time. Paul is in prison. It's not unlikely that Onesimus may have been in a jail cell for a short period of time. At any rate, Onesimus, whose name means useful, has become very useful to Paul, and an affection and friendship grow between the two. Now, legally, Onesimus should be sent back to the owner, and Paul doesn't want to do that, however, but he writes this letter and he tells Philemon to receive Onesimus not as a slave, but as a brother. You see, Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon, they're all in the same boat. They're all children of God. Paul is one of the great theologians of history, but he is no better at being a Christian than Onesimus or Philemon. They're all in the same boat. Just Christians called to love one another. Philemon is the legal owner of Onesimus according to the secular world at the time. And yet Onesimus becomes eventually, beyond this letter, becomes the bishop of the church of Ephesus. It's one of the radical things the Roman Empire had problems with in the Christian culture, that a slave could rise up in the church to have such a position of authority as that of bishop. We are all in the same boat. Before God, we are all equal. It's an American value that all men are created equal. It's a phrase that comes from the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson penned those words. Where did he get the concept? Well, some would say it came from John Locke of Voltaire. A scholar, Sarah uh, Rudin, says in her book, Paul Among the People, she argues that that concept started right here in Paul's letter to Philemon. It was here that Paul created the Western concept that an individual human is unconditionally precious to God, and therefore entitled to consideration, same considerations as other human beings. Before Baal wrote this letter, Rudin argues that a slave was considered subhuman, entitled to no more consideration than an animal. So easy to look at other people as subhuman. You see someone and you think, well, that person doesn't matter. Think again, we're in the same boat. A month ago, or no, it wasn't a month, it seems like a month ago, a few weeks ago, the American government shut down. You remember that? Seems like a long time ago. What was it, last week? We've gotten so used to this. It didn't happen decades ago, but it seems to happen with increasing frequency. And I'm no expert in the economy or the Constitution or politics, but I watch politicians, and every time there's a shutdown, the Republicans blame the Democrats, the Democrats blame the Republicans. doesn't matter who's in power. They demean and demoralize and dehumanize each other. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 
You were waiting on that. <laughs> I think they would get a lot more done if they would realize they're in the same boat. <laughs> it is. What kind of flowers we got there? I think they would get more done if instead of dehumanizing each other and demeaning each other, they would realize they're in the same boat. That boat being Congress, or better yet, the same boat being America. And until they begin to think of themselves that way, they're not going to get a lot of work done. It is all too easy to fall into the trap of it's us versus them, and they're not real people. But no, we're all in the same boat. And when Paul wrote Philemon and asked him to take back the runaway slave he told him not to receive him back as a slave but as family look at the former slave look at that person it's a person it's a human being look beyond the concept of ownership what a difference it would make if the next time we looked at others we would see human beings your boss your employer your employee your, your maid, your teacher, your student, your next-door neighbor, the other drivers on I-4, the stranger you meet in the store, each one a human being. The man can no longer look at a woman employer or employee as an object to be used. The wealthy cannot look at the poor as undeserving of help. We, like Philemon, need to see beyond the surface and see one another as people with hurts and pains and desires and dreams. Larry Nassar worked for two decades as a sports physician and as a trainer of some of the top Olympic uh, athletes in this country, was widely respected, and yet underneath there was a secret. He'd been molesting the young women under his supervision. In recent days, he was sentenced to 175 years in prison. And before being sentenced to prison, he had to sit in a courtroom and listen to one accuser after another. 156 women took turns speaking for seven days. How could anyone like this man do such terrible things to so many people? You're able to do that evil if you fail to see the humanity in other people. If you see them as subhuman, as objects. Nancy Ortberg is a Presbyterian minister in California. And before entering the ministry, she was an emergency room nurse. And she tells the story of what happened one night at the hospital at the end of her shift. It had been a busy Saturday night, and after a rush of severely injured patients uh, were brought in basically at the same time, things were beginning to quiet down finally, but the ER was still somewhat of a mess. And she overheard an ER physician debriefing a young resident about the procedures and the protocol and complimenting the young doctor on his competence. And then he put his hand on the resident's arm and asked, when you finished, did you notice the young man from housekeeping who came in and cleaned the room? The blank look on the man's face didn't even know that someone had come in to clean the room. He was oblivious to this man. And the older doctor said, his name is Carlos. He's been here for three years. Does a fabulous job. When he comes in, he gets the room turned around so fast so that you and I as doctors can get on to the next patient as quickly as possible. His wife's name is Maria. They have four children, and he named each of the children by name and by age. He lives in a rented house three blocks from here. They've been up from Mexico for about five years. I want you to speak to him, and more than that, next week I want you to tell me something about Carlos that I do not already know. It's easy to miss people. 
it's easy to ignore people. It's easy to fail to see them as human beings. And so Paul wrote to Philemon and said to him, Perhaps this is the reason Onesimus was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. A beloved brother who, like you and me, was created in the image of God and for whom Jesus lived and died. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all might, power, dominion, and glory, today and forever. Amen.